We have another uh, London presenter, um, Lauren Isles, who's a costume mounter at the V&A Museum. We'll talk about uh, getting bums on seats, displaying costumes on seated figures. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Lauren, and I am a textiles conservation specialist for the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Today, I've got a short presentation on how I recently developed two seated mannequins for two different displays. The budgets, time constraints, and context were very different for each mannequin, and so I'll explain the processes I undertook for each one. Also, as a quick disclaimer, Kira and I have brought a glossary and some examples of materials we talk about in our presentations, so please ask us about anything afterwards. So, without further ado, please let me introduce you to my first figure, Aubrey Essen Scott. This rather handsome racing car driver once said in an interview that his three loves were... Sorry. <laughs> a bit littler. <laughs> His three loves were motor racing, boat racing on the Thames, and Savile Row clothing. His beautiful evening ensemble, complete with tails, diamond cufflinks, and a gold toothpick holder, was set to be displayed in the recent exhibition Fashion in Masculinities, alongside a black suit worn by Marlena Dietrich and the famous black YSL suit worn by Claudia Schiffer. However, when we undertook an initial assessment of his outfit, we realised he was really quite tall. How tall? It's hard to know for sure, because in most of the images we have of him, he has stood behind a car, leaning over a car, or as you can see here, crashing through a barrier backwards in a car. But his trousers measured... <laughs> His trousers measured just underneath a full Lauren, so we think he was definitely well over six foot. He technically would have fitted inside the showcase at his full height, but we simply didn't have a mannequin tall enough. We didn't have any budget to get a fiberglass mannequin extended, and also the curator decided he may look a little out of place with the petite ladies displayed either side of him, and so she asked of him to be casually seated. I therefore decided to build him from scratch by reusing a papier-mâché torso from our stores along with a spare pair of wire arms with fiberglass hands and then use foss shape to create his lower torso and legs. This first image shows my initial very quick mock-up which broke the whole process down into more manageable pieces and meant that I could easily arrange the pose. Also, I'm sure most of you have heard of Foss shape, but if not, I have brought examples uh, with me to pass around. Uh, if you aren't familiar, Foss shape is a felt-like fabric that can be stitched into and solidifies um, when heat is applied. So you can create a mould from pretty much anything that can withstand the heat, especially fiberglass mannequins. This is the process we take to replicate limbs using Foss shape. First, pinning it around the mannequin whilst it's in its fabric state, marking the stitch lines, and then sewing it into, sewing it into a tube or sock, pull it back onto the figure, and steam heat it to solidify it into shape. I then simply cut down the stitch line to release it from the figure. Uh, this is how I made my first shape foot. To create Aubrey's foss shaped legs, I used this old fiberglass mannequin with slightly bent knees from our own stock and then used strips of plastic boning to quickly lengthen and twist them into the correct pose. I set the shape of the legs by filling in the gaps with strips of rime and then covered them in a fine layer of wadding and a final protective layer of black jersey. The torso also needed drastic alterations in order to create his fashionable wide chest and narrow waist. I selected a short torso that most closely matched the measurements of his jacket, but had a slight, slightly smaller chest. I then used fuss shape to replicate the shoulders, this time attaching them wider at the front to extend his chest whilst keeping the cross back narrow. 
The holes in the sides allowed the wire armatures to be securely screwed into the original torso using bespoke brackets made by our museum technician, Eric. Once padded to the correct dimensions, the torso was affixed to the back of the plinth with this bracket, also made by Eric. This allowed the torso to float at the correct height, ready for his bottom half to be attached. I made his waist, hips, and the slight curvature of his bottom from, once again, for shape, which I covered in black jersey and stitched to the torso at the waist. It's a little difficult to see here, but I kept the crotch hollow and added a small jersey pad loosely filled with wadding, which had a more natural finish than a solid shape. I then attached the legs to the hips using a few strips of cotton tape, which meant that I could easily uncross the legs to dress the trousers. In fact, the lightweight fur-shaped legs and the crotch pad are the only parts that are resting on the trousers and the plinth, allowing for a great deal of support, but with a very small amount of pressure to the trousers, something that would be tricky to accomplish with a seated, heavy fib fibreglass mannequin. I set the casual leaning pose using, yes, you guessed it, fur-shaped arms which I covered with jersey and stitched to the wide shoulders. To match the fiberglass hands and neck cap, I covered a fuss shaped neck with foam coat, buffed the surface until it was super smooth and painted over it using touch, tape, uh, touch up paint. It made a really cool fiberglass effect and I've got an example with me here to show you that was made for a previous project by my colleague Lilia. It's actually a bottom, <laughs> again. Um, the final touches were to add his collar, bow tie, shoes, and of course his diamond cufflinks. And here he is, casually reclining in his display case. I really enjoyed the challenge of creating a mannequin from scratch, and it's quite hard to tell that he isn't just another one of the fiberglass figures that surround him in the exhibition. However, the next figure that I developed was a ready-made seated fiberglass mannequin that I bought directly from a mannequin company, which sounds simple, but it had its own challenges. It's therefore time to, to introduce you to my other seated figure, Sateen. As you can see here, this spectacular costume is one in the iconic swing scene in Moulin Rouge, which you can still see in live performances on Broadway, the West End, and Australia. We wanted to recreate the theatrical magic of the character's entrance in our temporary display, Reimagining Musicals. And so, with much trepidation and excitement, the team and I endeavoured to display our costume on a figure that was seated on a swing, suspended from the ceiling on open display. This time, however, I had budget on my side, within reason, and because we were acquiring the full costume, it was agreed that we could purchase a full fiberglass bespoke mannequin that would then transfer to the main theatre and performance gallery on permanent display once the temporary exhibition finished. When perusing through mannequin catalogues for potential satines, I found this seated version from the Harlequin series by Proportion London, which had a good cross-legged pose and closely matched the measurements of the corset. So this was a great starting point as the seated aspect was already accomplished and we didn't need to use our time or budget getting a standard manne standing mannequin to sit. We luckily had a standing version of the Harlequin in the studio, which had the same measurements of the seated version, and so I could try the corset and boots on for size before ordering. You can see here, particularly from the last image, that it was a little bit snug, so I was able to liaise with the brilliant team at Proportion for them to make the circumference of the chest, waist and hips smaller, as well as altering the arm pose to match the reference image. Here are the progress images that Proportion sent. You can see how they changed the size and position of the bust and took sections out of the back and hips to meet the measurements that I sent to them, as well as to create the bend in the arms. Um, I was able to visit their workshop at this point to check out the progress in person rather than over the phone and emails, which was really lovely. 
Lastly, in order to, to get the correct fit for the boots, I tried them on a spare pair of Harlequin legs that we had kicking about in the studio, onto which I directly marked the necessary alterations. I then sent the legs to Proportion, who were able to replicate the cut lines directly onto our sateen. The image on the right is the final rendition before she was painted. And she's actually so well balanced, she's si simply sitting on the chair without needing a fixing, although she is affixed onto the display plinth plate with a spigot. The image on the left is when she arrived at the textiles conservation studio. The corset and the boots fitted wonderfully. I added a jersey barrier to the torso and padded the bust a little bit to support the bust cups. But other than that, she was ready to be dressed and take her place in the exhibition. And here she is in the display. So I didn't have quite as much to talk about with Satine as I did for Aubrey because the production team at Proportion did all of the shaping. But I was responsible for clearly communicating to them the accurate measurements and specific points of alteration which I was able to identify using my knowledge of garment construction and experience in costume mounting. I really love creating dynamic figures and believe that even the slightest alteration to the pose can make a big difference. For example, the actress who wore this costume in the musical Chorus Line in 1977 came to see her outfit in Reimagining Musicals last week and emailed to say that we brought her costume to life again. And that was simply by posing her arm with the hat like it is in the reference image. Her words really meant a lot, and looking forward, I'm hoping to develop more techniques in bringing costumes to life using dynamic posing. I would also love to know if you have any techniques that could help me in my future mounts. Thank you. <clears throat> so I have a question um, with the dynamic poses, uh, particularly the last one that you showed. Did you have any issues as far as having the body form stand up on its own? How are you keeping it on display? It looks like magic, doesn't it? Um, so the spigot um, is, so, you, so we have, when the mannequins arrive, they arrive on base pl plates uh, with the spigot attached. Um, and I particularly love using simply spigots that are drilled into the display plinths. Um, so the foot or sometimes the calf um, is where the, the, the spigot is locked into. Um, and that creates a bit more of a freestanding style. Um, so does it go through the foot or the shoe? It goes through the foot. So the, in the last image, um, the shoes are prop shoes. So we have a hole in, in, the, in the shoes. Um, but I, in the same display, we had um, another costume from the musical Six, uh, which has object boots. And so they, we use a calf spigot. Um, so it's a little bit further up, but the, the calf spigot is drilled into the display plinth and uh, goes into the leg of the mannequin. And that's the point which it's affixed to the plinth. Great, thank you. Thank you. We have a question from our virtual audience. How is the decision made to go headless on it's mannequins? Headless? Yeah, without a head. Oh. Um, it's, it's a design choice quite often. Um, usually we display uh, things with heads when there's a, an object to display, like a hat or, or something. It's a long um, discussion at the beginning of the design for, for the exhibition, whether we have heads or wigs. Um, and yeah, it's usually a design choice for a designer or a curator. We have another virtual question. How long are each of the costumes generally on display? Uh, it depends what, um, if it's for a, a temporary display. So it's usually about a year for temporary display. 
And even permanent display with costume, it's, it's about five, at the most, maybe 10 years. Um, it, is, it depends um, on rotations and, um, and on the permanent displays. Thank you, beautiful job. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I was just wondering how the hat was supported in the last image. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, my colleague Toby made the, the, the mount for the hat. And this is, he'd be able to explain it in a much better way than I do. Um, but he created a small wire mount um, that's drilled into the hand. And it goes, it, the, the wire attaches to a perspex disc that sits inside the, um, the brim, uh, the top of the hat. And the fact that it's perspex is also great because you can look up inside the hat and see the wearer's name, which was by Rodin, um, you know, in, by the um, wardrobe team for Chorus Line. So you can see her name inside the mount, which is lovely. And there's also, because it's um, held up and the wire goes into the, the hat itself, but there's also a very small bracket that sits on top of the brim of the hat, just keeping everything in place. Uh, and that's a, a particularly nice mount, that one. <laughs> Very clever. Do you, do you know what the um, substance is that was put on the mannequin, uh, the seated dancer mannequin? What, what did you coat that it with after it was modified, before it was painted? Um, it's a fiberglass mannequin, and um, it was painted um, using a royal paint. I don't know the, the chemicals, ins and outs of, of the painting, but it, it's spray painted. Um, sorry for my Yankee question, but is Perspex like a British plexiglass brand name? Or I heard you guys say it, and I also heard the first presentation say it. Um, ac acrylic. <laughs> Acry okay, very good, thank you. <laughs> like crisps and chips. <laughs> Lauren, I have the sample of the bum. I think this is the bum, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I notice it's foss shape, and then it has fabric, a fabric edge. And then what's the gray? Is that paint? That's the foam coat. Um, so uh, we apply, it's like a thick paste that we apply over and then buff it. Um, and once it's buffed, it, it creates a really smooth, um, smooth surface. And when we use the same touch-up paint that the mannequins are sprayed with, um, it looks just like the fiberglass. Um, it's a really clever thing. Yeah, this is nice. It will be um, explained a little bit more in the next <laughs> a little bit, the, 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 the painting. <laughs> Do you know if it's been audi tested? Uh, the foam coat? The foam coat. I guess so, yeah, I think so. I don't know if, for sure, but we already test literally everything over and over. <laughs> yeah, so, sorry, I have a virtual question as well from our virtual audience. Um, she asks, how do you attach the padding to the mannequin? Uh, it's stitched into. Um, so if there's a fiberglass mannequin that we're covering in wadding, uh, we always make a, a jersey cover, something that we can stitch into. Um, and if it's a papier-mâché torso, we can stitch straight into it. Um, yeah. Stitch. Thank you. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about how the um, seated mannequin is fastened to the swing itself to keep it from pivoting or anything like that? Yeah, so in the same way that standing mannequins have a foot spigot or a car spigot, um, the mannequin company created a spigot hole in, in the side of her leg and that spigot is, is about this big um, and that is drilled directly into the swing so she's um, lifted onto the swing um, and that's how she stays stays put. <clears throat> Thank you very much.